Welcome to Innovate for Impact, an informative mini-series brought to you by Tanya Gomez Consulting. In this series, we embark on a journey to explore the remarkable innovations that are shaping the landscape of the NGIS for a more inclusive future. Join us as we uncover inspiring stories of visionary individuals, organisations and technologies that are revolutionising the way we approach disabilities. Hi, Damien. Welcome to our series about innovation in the disability space, innovation for impact. Um, Today, I'm here to talk to you all about what you're doing at COCO Support Services, about your innovative respite services. Can you tell me, firstly, a little bit about COCO and your journey through the NJS? Yeah, okay. Thank you, Tanya. Um, I suppose what we're trying to do at, at COCO and why I suppose we initially set up COCO was to um, provide something a little bit different within the NDIS sector, specifically around respite. So we predominantly work in respite at the moment. um, And through my experience and through Renee's experience, um, we kind of, you know, we've got a shared 15, no, 35 years experience. So what we've got to see within the disability and community services sector is what works really well. And then we've also seen some of the things that we would like to do a bit better. Yeah. So COCO was born from um, a passion and, and I suppose a long history of working in the sector mm-hmm. and then wanting to put something a bit different that is authentically us to mm-hmm. that. So can you talk to me about what it is that you do that is different and what problem you're trying to solve? Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, Look, I think what we do that is different is we provide a personalised touch. Now, I think think it's easier to say that, um, providing a personalised approach to, to respite, but how we specifically do that is... We only have a maximum of two participants at any time. Um, I'd say probably 40 to 50% of the time, it's one participant in there. So they get a truly individualised experience. So, um, you know, so participants can get a truly individualised experience. Um, And that's just one layer of what we do. So I think anyone who would go onto the website, who would go onto our Instagram page, um, who would would speak to us would see that um, we're a little bit outside the box, uh, which we specifically want to be a little bit outside the box in the sense of um, we believe that we've created a a beautiful space. Um, Our authenticity around that is we we don't have stock images on our website we have real images uh real walkthroughs um we have us on there so we kind of um we don't kind of we actually step into that space as we are who we are um we provide an amazing experience um and you know we go above and beyond renee and i yep we're the you know i'm the managing director renee's the i suppose the founder and ceo but we we're on the floor a lot of the time, Mm. mentoring. So tell me about what a standard respite service is and um, why you thought that that wasn't working. Okay. Look, I think for the most part, it does work for most people. But I think now that, you know, the the spectrum of what... um, what identifies, you know, um, disability or... um, you know, people requiring service, people accessing NDIS um, is ever expanding. Mm. We wanted to create a space specifically for people who um, don't like to be overstimulated, mm. who can get really triggered by, you know, stimulation. Um, you know, people from a trauma history, uh, we're very much trauma informed in the sense that we create a tranquil space. We won't compromise that. Um, we will match people if we're going to have two participants in in our respite. We match them. It's not that we're um, not. I mean, we, we apply respite within the same framework that everyone applies respite. I think what we do differently is we really tailor an individualised experience. Mm. Um, we really focus on tranquility. Um, we really focus on a sensory experience in the sense of. Um, we want people to walk in and instantly feel relaxed. 
um, feel comfortable, feel like they're in a beautiful space, which they are. Mm. So is, is that down to the aesthetics of the of the environment or is that also to do with the supports that are provided? Definitely. It definitely starts with the aesthetics. I think that um, when people walk in or when people visit Coco, they'll, they'll notice a different colour palette. They'll notice a very um, beautiful colour palette. Um, and when they walk into the space, they'll notice that it doesn't have a clinical feel, it has a homely feel, but more than that, it has a almost an architectural feel mm. to it. Um, it's it's an amazing space. From the the space in itself is not enough. We've got a small team um, that we have curated over a long period of time. So our team um, shares our vision, and our team is a very tight knit community within within itself. So I suppose when we think about it as a service provider. You know, we're providing a service to participants, but we're also providing a space for staff as well. We want them to have just as, as an amazing experience as the participants because it's all a part of the community. Mm. So I think that's where we're a little bit different. I'd like to think um, that we can lead the way and, and sort of educate others on providing an experience for everyone, every key stakeholder who's, ex you know, in the respite sector. And, and so you spoke about the aesthetics of uh, being tranquil and being mm. des architecturally mm. designed. Why is that important when providing respite? Um, good question. I, look, when I think of respite and I think of the definition of respite, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a space to recover, relax. It's, it's a bit of a break from every day. Um, you know, people who are generally um, coming into respite for whatever reason, you know, there's a little bit of upheaval. They can be experiencing some sort of upheaval, a crisis to varying degrees, whether it's just, um, you know, family relationships that are strained, whether it's um, modifications in their, you know, place where they're living. Um, we want to, um, you know, create a feeling that when people come there that they have permission to relax. Mm. That's one of our catchphrases, permission to relax. We often find that uh, as a society, as a whole, the idea of relaxation and the idea of taking a break is, um, it has to be almost um, justified. Mm. We don't want to have to justify that. We want people to come in and have as an amazing experience as possible, you know, for a short time. Yeah. We understand that respite's a revolving door. That doesn't necessarily mean that um, it has to be a um, an experience that doesn't feel personalised or mm. beautiful, you know. Can you walk me through the process for what it looks like for a participant who's working with you? What, what does it mean to be personalised? How does that work? Yeah, okay. Well, I mean, we, we provide a maximum of two participants so um, when I'm, I suppose, talking about line items or item codes, you know, generally we work on a one-to-one -one or a one-to-two. For the most part, we find that people want to experience a one-to-one. -one. So they get a personalized support worker. Um, you know, we um, know the support worker really well. They're part of our team. So we believe and, and we have um, faith that they are going to give the participant the best experience possible. So that's right down to, um, you know, sitting down and working out what, what's an activity plan that the participant wants. What do they want to do? We're, we're lucky that we're in the Geelong area. So we've got a, access to a lot of beautiful natural resources. We've got the Surf Coast. We've got the Yu Yangs. We've got the Ballerine Peninsula. We've got many waterfalls. There's so many beautiful places that if, a, if someone wants to go and have a look at those or, or experience those while they're in respite, we can do that. Um, yeah, we're happy to provide um, activities and experiences that um, that we believe you wouldn't get in most services. Mm. So that could be um, trips to Hepburn Springs Day Spa. That could be trips to we've gone to um, an amazing experience, um, Mornington Peninsula Hot Springs. You know, so we really like to um, provide you know an amazing experience rather than being. Um, a time where people just can't wait to get back home. Look, we want everyone to want to get back home. Home is, you know, where the heart is, but we also want, um, 
you know, people to experience maybe a home away from home. Mm. What do you think is the challenge in providing this service? Yeah, okay. Why aren't more people yeah, offering right. it? Yeah, look, it's a good question and I'm not really sure, Tanya. Um, I'd like to think that that it is starting to change and that people are starting to um, look at providing a more individualised service um, to participants and to people, you know, needing respite or day, day program or whatever it is. I think there's a lot of room to do that. I think it's about, it's not necessarily even about spending more money. It's, it's about um, taking time to be in the moment with the participant. So for instance, um, you know, the challenges for a lot of places are, well, how do you provide, um, you know, an individualized menu um, for a participant, especially within respite, we're not sure, you know, what someone wants to eat. Well, what we do is we can't necessarily um, identify what someone wants to have as their meal prior, but what we can do is create fresh, healthful meals that we cook. Mm-hmm. You know, we're lucky we have a we have a chef who's decided to leave the chef in trade and come into support work. So we're really lucky in that sense. Um, but I don't know if it's necessarily a challenge um, that that exists where people can't provide a personalised service. I think it's just a matter of, well, what are your goals? Mm. Our goals have always been to keep it small, keep it unique, um, create a boutique experience. When we keep those sort of goals in mind, it's really easy for us to make a decision on how to move forward. Mm. Yeah, that sounds that really sounds good. So what you do differently, if I'm to summarize, is that you tailor an individual experience over their time with you so that you're making sure that they meet their goals, that they're able to relax. You yep. tailor the schedule of the yep. outings or the activities that yep. you do as well as the meals and you handpick a uh, individual support worker to take them over this journey. Yes, yeah. Um, and you do that in a boutique manner so that you can meet their needs yeah, first absolutely. and foremost. Absolutely. So do you think that this is something that other providers could be doing and should be doing? I think I think absolutely. I think with, um, you know, with, with the way that NDIS is evolving um, and with the... I suppose the way, you know, we're all evolving, we're all getting a better understanding of how NDIS works. You know, participants you know, getting a great understanding of how NDIS works. And I think the participants, you know, as does everyone, has a right to um, advocate for the experience that they deserve to have, they feel like they deserve to have. And, and you know, w- with, as I mentioned earlier, the you know, the expansion of understanding or the scope of what disability is, um, there's so much room to work within that. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, there's so much um, opportunity to work within that. You know, this, this idea that one size fits all um, hasn't worked in any sector ever. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we have to continue to move forward and strive to pr- provide that mm-hmm. service. The challenge for us, and I suppose the challenge for, you know, a number of services could be, well, you've got to balance, you know, being able to be responsive to people in need um, with are we the appropriate service for that particular person seeking a service. And sometimes, you know, it's a hard call to make sometimes and and sometimes there's no 100% right answer. Um, And sometimes the decision we make, others may not agree with. Um, but staying very clear and, and as I mentioned before, staying, you know, on the front line and on the ground, we get a very real working experience of what will work and what won't work. Yeah, right. And what would be your advice to other providers that are considering or have seen your model and are considering having a respite service or a day program that is yeah. both beautiful and person-centred? Yeah, well, I think um, for us, it's about authenticity. So I think we've created the space that only we could create because we've developed this aesthetic as a husband and wife team to over a long period of time. Um, so I think we've created a space that's uniquely Coco, but that doesn't mean that someone else can't provide a unique space mm. for themselves that 
may not be cocoa, but may be just as beautiful. In fact, I'm positive that someone can do it. Mm. You know, we don't have the monopoly on beauty or creating a beautiful space. Um, we've just created a space that we find really easy to create because we love it. Yeah. You know, um, as far as, you know, you know, I, I think it's really easy sometimes, um, you know, for, for small business to kind of want to capture as much um, of the, the market as possible. And I think that's a mistake that a lot of people can make. Um, we certainly don't do that. We work within a space that we can feel really confident and comfortable that will provide the, the best space that or the best um, experience that we can possibly um, provide mm. makes it easy for us but it also makes it a challenge for us because you know we can't we're not a one size fits all yeah um the challenge for us and i think the challenge for a lot of services now is to well you know we already recognize at coco that we need to expand in a way um but we have to really work hard at not expanding um through a sense of um just meeting needs that are out there we all know the needs are out there you know, services can't keep up for the most part with the need that's required. Um, but what we have to do is we have to expand or provide options that are relevant to us and to the participants so that, say for instance, if which we are looking at, we're looking at um, doing a uh, younger people's um, respite. Mm. Um, we have to make it work for younger people as well as for ourselves so that the young people that come into COCO have as a great experience as our existing participants have at Tranquility House. Mm. Not everyone's going to vibe with Tranquility House. Some people like that high intensity sort of stuff. We want to be able to meet those needs as well, mm. but we want to do it right. Yeah. So I guess what you're talking about there is <clears throat> is scaling the business in a way that is still delivering consistent outcomes. Yeah, absolutely. Still able to meet the need and not compromise on what's authentically Coco. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, and I, I'm curious about the business model. So from from what you've said, you deliver high uh, a one on one personalized support. You're still operating within the the given price guide. Yeah. How do you make? How do you still make a profit and make this a sustainable business if if your costs yeah, that's, are that's potentially really, more? That's a really good question, mm -hmm. um, and I think that's always going to be an ongoing challenge. Um, so, so what we do is, um, you know, I think pr if you stick with consistency of service, I think if you you know develop strategies that that are repeatable on a day at the same time as as still be um personalized to a particular person then then the scalability and the the profit is there you know i mean look you know you know we we want to be around in 20 years time the only way to be around in 20 years time in this market is to be able to you know sustain the service that we provide um, how we do that, you know, if I'm speaking of specifics is, um, you know, we try, we try to cost, cost equalize wherever possible. So, you know, so, so say for instance, you know, if a participant comes in, you know, for three days now, um, most support coordinators and participants, you know, understand, um, the, um, the respite, uh, or short-term accommodation guidelines and they know that a weekday is a lot cheaper than the weekend, you know, because of, you know, penalty rates and staffing and all that sort of stuff, you know. So, you know, so we have someone, they'll generally come in on a weekday. Look, if, if they come in and stay, you know, three or four days, the experience can be a lot better than just coming in for 24 hours, mm. you know, because there's a lot more room for us to move, you know. We, we know that, um, that, you know, people want to have a memorable experience and we want to provide that, you know, so where we can take the hit, the financial hit, you know, I'm providing something that's not funded within the NDIS that, that we will fund as COCO support services, um, you know, within that 
I suppose, the framework of can we afford this? If we can afford it, we'll do it. Mm. If we can't afford it, then we can't offer it. Yeah. And I think it's just about, you know, um, like I said, Renee and I are hands-on very much so and I think we will be forever because we love it and we're really, um, you know, we're really protective of our brand and, and the experience that people have. Um, so, you know, of course, you know, that means that, you know, if, if we're staff, if we're actively staff, then, you know, we can provide a service because we're there anyway. Mm. Do that make sense? Yeah, that no, makes sense. Um, what further innovations would you like to see in the respite space? What, what else would you like to be able to deliver? Okay, yeah. Well, we, we talked about a little bit about, you know, our own personal expansion. Um, we see there's, there's still a lot of gaps and there's still a lot of challenges out there. Um, you know, we would like to provide um, and have an appropriate space for people with, um, you know, significant mobility issues. Um, so, you know, our end goal is to have a space where, you know, it's completely, there's hoist, you know, um, fitted throughout, throughout the space where we can provide an amazing cocoa experience for people who, you know, do have, you know, mobility issues in the sense of require a lot of um, physical support in that, that sense. Um, but obviously to set something up like that is, is a, a lot of money, mm. um, but it's something that we definitely have um, as part of our plan moving forward. Um, also to, I worked in the community sector, AOD, uh, mental health for many, many years. And my personal passion is the intersectional um, context of, of forensic clients who also have disability. Um, you know, I think the services out there, there's some great services out there and, and, you know, there's definitely a lot of services out there, but I would like to go into that space and see that if I can provide a space for people who are coming out of jail, who do have a disability, um, you know, uh, a, a residential space for them that feels meaningful to them. Mm. You know, um, I think, you know, that that part of the sector, I think is, is really in need of some um, support and certainly more um, resources in that area. But again, you know, that's, that requires a completely different approach again. Yeah. It sounds like you have lots of goals and yeah. lots of future aspirations to continue mm. to mm. innovate um, for impact in the space. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been really great to hear all about what you do at Coco Support Services. And for everybody who hasn't seen how beautiful it is, how can they have a look at all of your images? Yeah, okay. So look, we're on all the social media platforms, so Facebook, Coco Support Services, on Facebook, on Insta, um, we're on LinkedIn as well. Um, the best way is probably to go on our uh, website, which is www.cocosupportservices.com.au, and we have a full walkthrough. So again, like I said, you know, you can you know you can really get a true idea of what you're going to be walking into um, when you come and stay with us. And whereabouts are your current locations, and who who are you serving? Okay, so we're we're in Geelong. Um, but we we seem to be serving um, all over Victoria. Uh, again, that's one of the uh, the things that we can do is we can provide transport, um, you know, regardless of where someone is, you know, to come and stay with us if they want to come down to the Ballerine Peninsula and stay in Geelong. Uh, so it seems to be Victoria wide, sometimes New South Wales and Tasmania as well. Wow. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. No it's problem. been wonderful to learn all about you. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks. On the next episode of Innovate for Impact. Chosen Family, in essence, was birthed out of a desire to bring joy, first of all, back to the NDIS sector. I think we've become so commercialised that we've forgotten that we're in the care sector at this stage. Um, and then, you know, kind of that motto of co-designing individuals' futures with them, because ultimately they're the experts in their own lives. Oh, 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 oh,
Thank you for joining us on another enlightening episode of Innovate for Impact. Stay tuned for more thought-provoking conversations and innovative ideas that drive positive change within the NDIS space. Remember, together we're shaping a future where innovation and impact go hand in hand.